co-host Mike McAuliffe. And, uh, We'll thank, thank you for joining us. Yes, Card is at Champs, which is an industry trade show that hits Vegas twice a year, and it's the custom handmade American products show, and they do everything from uh, uh, glass pipes and uh, grinders to um, uh, spice, which I, I just don't really think is a good thing. I don't think they can do spice here at the trade show anymore, but have they, they used to. Well, here in Nevada, they legalized it. But uh, <clears throat> for a long time, yeah, that was one of the whole. That's where you would get your wholesale distribution of that, of I, that stuff. I am not. I, I am not in any way a a prohibitionist. Um, you know, I'm very libertarian on this view, and as long as it doesn't affect other people, uh, people should be able to put what they want in their bodies. But I, I've got to say these these prohibitionistas uh, that have been out there fighting against uh, the legalization of, of cannabis for all these years and other things, they've been for the past several years up in arms about spice and oh how bad it is and this and that and <laughs> fine, okay and, and I agree with them on this it, it is bad stuff, it can cause psychosis and other things so use the natural alternative. Why? I just don't like how they call it. They're like, oh, it's synthetic marijuana. It's synthetic marijuana. I don't like that label. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I never really appreciated that label. It's just a chemical compound that they use to synthesize. Uh, what do they use, use it for to kind of activate the receptors the, in yes, your brain? Yes, the endocannabinoid receptors. And, like and, and the thing is, um, with, with pot, there's thousands of varieties, but mm -hmm. it's still pot. Right. And that's how it is. But with uh, this spice, with this synthetic uh, cannabis, what you have happening is, um, since it is created in a lab, as you say, uh, anytime the, the DEA gets uh, something prohibited and, you know, this specific formula or that specific formula, the chemists just go back in and tweak a molecule yeah. or two here and there, and now they've got something that's perfect. You know, that's legal. why they just did a broad base ban over the whole thing mm -hmm. here in Nevada and just kind of got rid of it. But. Uh, Mostly, I think I actually enjoyed the Champ Show. It kind of snuck up on me this year. I believe uh, the American Glass Expo just wrapped up yes. yesterday, so that they no longer overlap, which is, which is I suppose convenient for the attendees, but not so convenient for the uh, for the vendors who now have to extend their stay for an extent for a period. Oh, of time. they have to spend a few more dollars they in have Vegas. To spend what a, a few shame. more days. Yeah, just one yeah. of those things. But we're happy to have them. So we yeah. absolutely are. And and these shows, um, it it. it shows an underlying dichotomy in how Las Vegas and Nevada react to this issue because we know for years the police have been very very uh, gung-ho hardline on anything to do with pot and and yet you have these shows coming in to into Las Vegas and bringing in a large amount of money to the, oh, to the sure. coffers um, several times a year and they're absolutely fine with that. It's a lot of non-gaming revenue for sure. We're happy to have that uh, that ancillary revenue stream here in Nevada. Like people don't even realize they just they think oh you know they come to town and and they have the trade show, but really you know they're spending money on hotel rooms and restaurants mm -hmm. and all that. I was up in uh, in Summerlin recently up on uh, in Boca Park and I saw a champs related van i think it was like the dude tube, the dube tube guys or something like that mm -hmm. were over there and it just oh no it was at the red rock that's right and it just clicked with me like oh here these guys are way away from the show off the strip mm -hmm. you know giving some of these locals casinos a little bit of business and it's just uh it's it's and, it's nice and, to see. and the show keeps getting bigger while his name is looting me at the moment <clears throat> um, um i met the guy who founded the dube tube company uh back in 09 or so and what a nice guy he is yeah. and he is just um uh you know just coming up with something that he can make that is ancillary that has no legal jeopardy whatsoever that services the market and uh, you know i have met so many truly nice people who are on the fringes of this business and who are not getting back into uh they may they have prior experience but they're not getting back into it whether for legal concerns or, or other, um, but there's a real camaraderie and a, a sense of fellowship in the people who are working in this industry um, overall uh, because they know they're fighting together for a common cause. And last week we had the Nevada Dispensary Association, Association on the show, and um, uh, they too, they're forming a trade industry mm -hmm. to work together. And that doesn't mean that they're not going to cut each other's throats to make a little profit <laughs> now and then. We'll see how that, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it, I suppose, after November. 
<clears throat> I, I just and places are continuing to open up, and that's going to drive more patients into the program. Uh, I just saw a, a dispensary opened up within the past week or two, I guess, mm -hmm. on uh, Flamingo in Maryland. So they're really starting to populate throughout the valley, and and that's a good thing. And ultimately, this is going to uh, bring a lot of money into the state of Nevada, and you know, it, not well, just in the medical side but if we have legalization well and that's another thing it's not just about the people coming to town spending their money for the trade shows that's exactly what I was saying is if some of these companies start incorporating here in Nevada mm -hmm. we're gonna see all kinds of uh, potential like you said ancillary industries pop up that aren't directly affiliated with the dispensaries or with the grow operations or things like that that will provide additional tax revenue additional jobs and etc it's really American capitalism at work it's kind of uh, it's kind of nuts to see how large these trade shows have gotten I remember it was just one one aisle and mm -hmm. now it encompasses the entire uh, the top south floor of the yeah. South Hall the Las Vegas Convention Center which is you know that's a lot of space yes and uh, we'll see we'll see if it continues to grow I certainly hope so yeah absolutely <clears throat> it's uh, it's bringing more revenue to the town uh, bringing bringing more money into the local economy because it legitimizes of, yeah. it too I think by having a real trade show in a real convention center and you know kind of doing it I don't want to say the right way but uh, the corporate way I suppose uh, to, uh, to legitimize it uh, yes it, it does in in the views of the Las Vegas Convention of Visitors Authority and and uh, maybe some locals but it's not the sort of thing uh, that gains national attention no. that, that you're that you're having these shows but um, what will gain national attention is the fact that um, uh, votes to uh, legalize uh, recreational cannabis will be on the uh, ballot in up to seven states this year and I say up to seven because not all of the uh, the filing periods are done for gathering the signatures for these initiative we're, but we're getting uh, pretty close to it we gotta I mean if you're gonna organize a campaign and try to get the, get out the vote and do a voter registration drive and all that kind of stuff I mean we're, we only have a few months left yes absolutely but you know for most of these states um, it, it has already been done and it's going to be on the ballot uh, in in I think five at this point and there are still two that are undecided of course the big player in this is California uh, which uh, which on its own uh, consumes something like 20 percent of the of the nation's pot and home so, to one out of every 11 Americans yes absolutely and and, and that's why but um, there was a very interesting article in the Las Vegas Sun uh, on July 15th uh, that's that was entitled it was an editorial actually so it's not authored out it's not to a single reporter's view but it is the viewpoint of the Sun editorial staff and it was entitled how much would legal pot do for Nevada's economy and there are some um, some very respectable numbers here um, and if question two passes in November uh, Nevada voters will spark up uh, a 7.5 billion dollar economic activity uh, level in the first seven years of the program and you know while seven years sounds like a, a, a long term um, I can tell you seven years ago uh, this program was still being run by the Department of Agriculture and they were trying to choke it off and keep it as small as possible so and here uh, we are now and yeah and so, so seven years can move pretty quickly but some of these yeah. numbers are just uh, um, mind-blowing um, 1.7 billion dollars would be the total wages uh, and business owner income that would be generated in the first seven years after legalization I mean, and I would say the bulk of that is going to go to the owners, not the workers. Right. You know, like in any capitalistic system. Uh, but that's that's still a chunk of money. So you can see why these business owners and these various partnerships were spending so much money to get these licenses initially in the yeah. first round. Well, I remember someone telling me they're like, you know, what's the, what's the big draw? Why 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 cannabis? Why don't you go? into something else and I said look you know um, the first day I worked at a dispensary I saw all this cash coming through the door and it wasn't about that the real overwhelming um, mindset for me was when one of our distributors came in and he said there's nothing else that you can grow in your closet that sells for three thousand dollars a pound and it just kind of made me scratch my head and think a little bit about how hard people work to do normal farming or do any kind of normal job and it's just, a lot easier than gold mining yeah oh my god no kidding all the dry mining and things like that it's just the profit potential 
is of course out outrageous. It's uh, it's sal it's salivating. But almost. but a lot of that profit potential is because of the prohibition of pot. Uh, if it were not, you you would see the prices fall, just as you have in Colorado and Washington, Oregon, uh, where where it is legal. Um, you find that that the number is coming down for the consumer and. That's ultimately a for sure, thing. but then like the continuing evolution of the alcohol industry is is uh, kind of strange to me. Well, not strange, but uh, interesting to me. How we had when I was a little kid, most people drank the very basic beers like mm -hmm. Budweiser and Heineken and things like that. And now within my lifetime, there has been this huge craft beer explosion that's seen thousands and thousands of breweries open up all over the country in response to their, I guess, rejection of what they think boring beer is. And of course, now there's a lot of independent wineries opening and things like that. So just when you thought, oh, well, alcohol has been around forever, there's nothing else they can do with it. Here they come with more. And the cannabis industry is just getting a little taste of that. They've been able to do all these amazing things under the shadow of prohibition, mm -hmm. develop all these incredible strains, do all these things without all of that public uh pub, what's the what's the word i'm looking for that that safety net of being in the public of, eye of being of, legal yeah of not um, having to worry yeah. about getting arrested for developing their own and, you know and it's interesting make a living. that you say that because we have um from three strains uh, which are sativa indica and ruderalis to a much lesser extent um pro um underground uh, botanists uh, have created thousands of strains of cannabis. It's incredible. I wonder what's going to happen in the next decade as we have legal cannabis throughout yeah. the country. And so Are that's why have... when they say, oh, you know, we're going to have $1.7 billion of economic activity, we don't really know how high well, this can go. That's just income. Yeah, we don't know how high this can go. Because also, uh, $464 million, almost half a billion dollars, will be the total tax revenue that would be generated in those first seven years. That's money that goes to the state. That's money that can build schools, that can build That's roads. a lot of money. That that's, is, that's a lot of money. That, you know, but you have to take everything in perspective. It is a fair amount of money, but um, I recall arguing this with the legislature back in, in 2011, trying to, to move this bill forward uh, uh, when Paul Aisley who was a friend of the sure. show, uh, had first uh, introduced a bill to legalize cannabis in Nevada, uh, they were like, well, we're facing a $4 billion shortfall. So, you know, $30, $50, 100000000 million, that don't mean anything to us. At, you know, most people, I, it would make a difference to And I think one of the other reasons people are getting into this is because what you see here with this new industry, which is a newly emerging industry legally mm -hmm. is one of those once in a lifetime opportunities if people it had is. the smarts and the and the money to invest in microsoft back then or the tech industry the internet industry before the bubble burst um they you know that would be a uh, their boon, but not everybody could afford to do that. I think this is potential. I mean, I've said it before. I'll say it again. I still believe that med our recreational cannabis could be the most lucrative investment opportunity since alcohol came out of prohibition, or mm -hmm. maybe in Nevada, since uh, gaming was was regulated back in the fifties. Right. Know, I mean, uh, this is this is. This is it for, for my generation, at least, or this is our opportunity to well, kind of as, as we jump look forward. At, uh, the American economy becoming more of a service economy and people being worried about um, automation now, uh, robots taking people's jobs. Oh, that's, you know, that's not, serious. Not just going offshore uh, to lower markets, but, but uh, robots. And it is serious. Well, but yeah. what this industry would, uh, would produce would be uh, <clears throat> estimated 40,975, uh, so almost 41,000, the total number of full-time jobs that would be added to the Nevada economy in the first seven years after legalization. And that's not insignificant when you have people losing their jobs, manufacturing jobs due to outsourcing. And sure. when uh, in this same time period, I was reading in, in The Sunday, which is one of our, our uh, alternative uh, weeklies, that um, they expect over the next decade that um, waitressing jobs, bartending jobs are all going to go down as a result of automation. Oh, it's even more than that. Um, I read an article about 
three, four weeks ago that said that Foxconn, which is a company that's subcontracted by Apple to make the iPhones in China, has recently replaced 30,000 workers with robots, and they're experimenting with fully automating their line. <clears throat> uh, Carl's Jr. Hardee's has recently come out and said that they are building a fully automated fast food restaurant with no staff. Domino's Pizza has introduced a pizza delivery robot in New Zealand that has a cooling compartment on one side for the drinks and a heating compartment for the pizza on the other side. It rolls up to your door and sends you a text message. You put in the code and the door's open for where your pizza is. Wow. All of these jobs, I mean, people kind of scoff at it and say, oh, it's way, way down the line. It's happening so fast. And as a matter of fact, within the past couple of years, a California company introduced a product called Medbox, which oh, was yeah. a, a medical cannabis uh, automated automated dispensing machine. And you I know, was you lucky enough to sit next to him at one of the NCIA dinners a couple of years ago. Really? He was a nice guy, yeah. You know, and, and it's a good idea. But I would say that as, as one who uh, has a little red wine now and then, or a little white wine, I never developed that, that connoisseur's palate for wine. And, and, you know, there are a huge variety of choices. And I do believe that when you're talking about thousands of varieties of cannabis, that, um, that people are not going to want to go up to a box with a hundred choices and say, oh, well, what am I going to pick now? That the idea that you will have knowledgeable retailers, bud tenders, um, uh, dispensaries, whatever the retail locations are going to be called back then, uh, who are a going to be able to steer people in the right direction, mm -hmm. those jobs are not quickly going to go to automation. I heard... Uh one of another friend of the show, Michael Jameson, was talking to me about his bud tenders at Las Vegas Relief, and they called themselves Saint Sommeliers. Ooh, and I, I like thought, that. That, yeah, and that was the funnest name I had heard that's been tossed around for for bud tenders or can of connoisseurs or whatever you want to call yourself, because this the Saint Sommelier word implies that level of professionalism, that mm -hmm. level of discretion, that you have the terminology and the verbiage to really go into the description that a real upper class consumer would want to hear mm -hmm. and you can upsell with that kind of knowledge and things like that it's good for the business and it's good for the industry and absolutely it's good to see that there are real tax paying jobs that are being created by this industry and that they're going to be in potential to be good paying full time jobs yes, <laughs> yes. and it, it, it goes beyond just the cannabis industry itself but the ancillary businesses that support it security construction and financial when the when the senate and the, when the government gets yeah. its uh, uh it gets its priorities in order but there the report figures that by 2024 uh seven years after legalization um the number of jobs that would be supported uh per year by the regulation of the drugs so that's the the inspectors the the various uh bureaucrats that oversee this would be 6200 that that's a that's a fair chunk in itself and yeah I, you know i know that as a republican you're probably not uh big on expanding uh i was uh, just thinking i'm like 6200 people seems like a lot but when you really start adding it up it doesn't seem out of the realm of possibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, uh, it seems like a lot for Nevada. Well, and, and that's going to generate over that period of time $1.1 billion uh, for the annual cost of uh, economic activity related to regulation. So just as a couple of years ago when all these companies were, were all these partnerships were throwing money at the state to get their applications mm -hmm. and, and the Department of uh, Health and Behavioral Services uh, r realized a windfall of several million dollars, that's going to happen in a, in a much bigger way over mm -hmm. here. Um, and finally, um, $224.2 million is the estimated amount that Clark County visitors would spend on marijuana, not in seven years, in 2018, years. Yeah, that's the just first year in after. a single year after, after this well, is done. That's all tied to a couple of factors. Do we get the Raiders? Where is the stadium? Mm -hmm. How, and most importantly, how much money is the Las Vegas, Las Vegas Convention and Visitors Authority willing to embrace this? Yeah. Because they're really our biggest potential cheerleader in all this. They are the entity that brings all the people to town. They are that overwhelming, you know, the, what happens in Vegas stays here campaign. That's yep. all the LCVCA. Yep. So, uh, LVCVA. And uh, if they are willing to I don't want to say educate people, but attempt to enlighten people on the fact that it's okay to come here and smoke cannabis, 
that would be a huge deal because it's going to be outrageously expensive for these independent businesses to attempt to get that word out. I, I mean, once it's recreationally legal, I guess the word will get itself out. But really, uh, well, pretty quick, I, I, I would love to see a, I don't know, I don't want to say an organized campaign, but I guess that is what I want, really, once it goes recreationally legal. I want them to embrace it just like they embrace advertising anything else. And anything else. And, and with that, we're going to take a quick break and be right back. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state-approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency, all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. Welcome back uh, and I, to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. And I'd like to go into a story next, which um, uh, I've, been, I've been following this issue for some time. And it's finally starting to gain some traction. And this comes from uh, theinfluence.com by Sh Shalene Title. Uh, and the, the uh, article is titled, How Insidious Laws Are Keeping Many from Participating in the Promising Legal Marijuana Industry. Absolutely. And we just talked in, in the last segment how this is kind of a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for people uh, to get involved in this industry, um, you know, because the it's now coming into the sunlight. Now, it's an industry that is um, that is developing within a legal framework, and it's very different from illicit industries. Um, and so, for most people, this is that kind of once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. But what's happening is that the industry is being it's replacing two things that already existed. The illicit market from which marginalized people have been able to make a living and a system of prohibition that has ruined people's lives by arresting and incarcerating them for doing the very thing that people are now receiving licenses to do. Yeah. And that really gets to me that, that these, you know, people, especially in the medical area, who have been helping people for years and got uh, uh, persecuted for it uh, are being prohibited from getting involved in, yeah, in this well, industry. There's an old saying, pioneers get slaughtered and settlers get the land. Huh. And these days the settlers are getting the land and a lot of these settlers, you know, uh, I don't want to say didn't pay their dues, but I didn't, I didn't see them when things were bad. Well, and uh, here we are. And it's not just about that. This is about people who are a little bit more I don't want to say like just who are, uh, vocal, who are out there who, well know. and let's just take it to the average guy who might have been arrested for possession or something like that and is now prohibited from doing various things depending on the jurisdiction you may be in depending on how strict that entity was depending on which state you're in or which county you're in or whatever their clauses are determining what was an excluded offense what's mm -hmm. not an excluded offense why what the term limits are for the time frames it's a it's a mess depending on where you are um and here in nevada we had to fight that battle during legislature and we're, that's still that's still an issue when, when i first moved to nevada nevada was still a two seeds or a felony state and no, up don't until, gamble with marijuana. Yeah, really. And <laughs> and just till till recently, uh, uh, anything above an ounce is was a felony mm -hmm. possession. And so it's it's coming around now, but it it is way too slow. And the article continues that felony exclusions are the provisions of state marijuana laws that prevent people with certain criminal backgrounds from entering the marijuana industry. And originally, the justification for these restrictions was that they provided an additional measure of security for an unprecedented type of business. And so this goes to that whole meme of, of regulating it like it's plutonium, not pot. And, mm -hmm. and that they wanted to be so careful that the bad element didn't get involved in this that um, they just 
decided to exclude the class of people who were most expert at the industry. And not only that, but the people who have been bold enough to attempt to make a living off this and try to develop that knowing damn well what the potential consequences were. Well, yeah. Imagine <laughs> that you're someone who had been growing or selling uh, marijuana for years, long before it was legal to do so. In any other industry, demonstrated interest and experience would count in your favor when hunting a job. But not, not here. And due to well-documented uh, in enforcement. If you come from an over-policed community, you're far more likely to have a drug conviction than someone from another community who's engaged in exactly the same behavior. Is it fair to block the person with a conviction but allow the person who was less likely to encounter police and perhaps more likely to afford a lawyer uh, to enter this business and you know there that gets into a whole class warfare yeah I was just gonna say that's kind of a tricky subject to dive into um, that's where legislation has to come in you have to have you know the lady justice is supposed to be blind right supposed you know, to be that's the whole that's the whole reasoning behind that so if you're you know uh, you can call both ways if you want to you know call both ways ref if you want to have a sports analogy or whatever yeah but uh, I, I I don't exactly know how to balance that. You want to say, oh, we'll take it on an individual level, but that's kind of the whole problem with it is you can't really take it on an individual level. You, if you're going to do it to one person, it has to be, it has to be that way. So mm -hmm. that's why we have to work to uh, undo undo this damage, unfortunately, with all these all these various. It's going to take quite quite a bit of time to do that. Well, after even if Obama came out tomorrow and said it's recreationally legal, the war would not be over. No. It's not over until not only are all the people who are current ser serving sentences for marijuana out of jail, but all of their records have to be expunged so that they can lead normal lives again. And not until then, and even then it's not over because there will be firearms issues and this and that. There's always a battle to fight, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But well, when, when people with, with convictions are blocked from the legitimate industry, the, the regulated market causes them to lose income. And so what's happening in, in this country, you know, you do the crime, you serve your time, you pay your debt to society, and then you're supposed to be able to move on and have a second chance. And these that's exclusion not, laws are preventing that. Yeah, happening. that's not how it goes, though. So often when you get out and you serve your time and you, quote, pay your debt to society, you've only begun to pay your debt to society because you have that, I guess, like that scarlet letter for the rest Convictions of your life. Are, 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 are lifetime scarlet letters. Uh, I recall reading in the RJ uh, a few weeks ago before the primary, and they were discussing candidates for this office or that office or whatever, and uh, one, of the, uh, one of the guys, uh, it said, you know, ex-felon and whatever his business was. And so we have that ongoing persecution that somebody, you know, did something wrong and now they're a bad person and they're irredeemable and that is how that they are are looked upon by society while we are at a time where the average person violate, commits three or four felonies a day on federal government regulations mm -hmm. just by stuff they're doing if they change the oil in their car and and you know they pour it in the backyard or they pour it down the drain oh my god they're a felon but it seems that in this area, uh, it, it's where the focus is because it's such an easy area to go after people. It's always been easy to pick on cannabis patients and cannabis consumers, and this is just another example of that. I wanted to touch back on what you were saying about how pre prior experience helps in every other industry except this one. Mm -hmm. That is the sad truth. If you walk in and you say, look, I've been growing you know, up in California or whatever for all these years, they're going to say prove it mm -hmm. or you know something to that effect and I've heard a lot of stories about these growers who feel like they want to go legit they want to come in and do it legit for a for a, a team and then find out that they're like oh well we'll give you thirty five thousand forty thousand dollars a year and they're like look you know you don't seem to understand I'm making and making you six know figures, yeah, yeah I'm making you know well more two three four five times that in some of these cases mm -hmm. and it's just not it's worth the risk to keep doing it the way they're doing it rather than seek the nominal reward of being a taxpayer now. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it just is what it is. And I'm not pushing the blame onto the, onto the teams because I understand there are a lot of expenses, but it's just going to come to a head at some point. Some of these... Uh, and and it's, it's just kind of ridiculous that, that they're doing this, uh, you know, 
marijuana offenses are typically nonviolent offenses. If there are guns around pot, it's because the prohibition has made this substance as valuable as gold. And, and if you've got a lot of gold, you probably have some guns to right. protect it as well. Right. And so, you know, I, I know of a fellow who was um, uh, up in Oregon with a, with a company that's got multiple retail outlets, and he's involved, he's licensed mm -hmm. from the state. Uh, they've just recently bought a, a piece of a dispensary down here, but he cannot get his card in Nevada to, to work at this place because he has, um, he has a felony conviction for pot. And uh, so he's legal in Oregon. Nevada says, no, 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 we're, we're not going to let you in. You're, you're a bad person. You know, if we but believe- it was, for can it was for cannabis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if we believe that formerly incarcerated people should be given the chance to build a career and a life again, uh, then this industry should be no different than any other. And I, I've been saying this for a long time, so we can has that, you know, let's treat this like any other industry. Uh, it, this is not something where you're going out and killing and taking advantage of people and, and doing horrible things. Uh, you know, just normalize the industry. And we... In, Look, just regulate them like anyone else. If they pass the business licensing and you catch them cheating, you shut them down. If they're not, then you just let them operate. I don't know what these people are afraid of. Do they think that these big bad felons are going to take away their business because they can operate that much better? If the free market dictates that they're good operators, they'll stay open. And if they're not, they won't. And there's such a patchwork of laws. And I know, you know, you, you've spent time in Alaska and that, um, uh, you, you know, you look to go back there and it's great. You don't have a felony conviction because the most most egregious example in the country uh, is it goes beyond felonies. In Alaska, for example, you can't apply for a retail license if you've been found guilty of even a misdemeanor involving a controlled substance within the pr pr preceding five years. Oh, so Alaska. even if you got busted for a joint and and got a That's misdemeanor right. conviction, the state of Alaska will not let you have a retail license. It's insane. They are, they're very, very exclusionist up there, almost like the Hawaiians are, where they're very insulated in their society. They don't like outsiders. They don't want you up there. And this is a, re, this is a way for them to shun them. And, 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 and like they also had a clause to where no non-Alaskans that weren't currently collecting the permanent fund dividend mm -hmm. could apply. That means basically like a year and a half to two years of residency were required in order to do that. Now, of course, yeah, it's just really hamstringing a lot of these teams' abilities to raise money and uh, get the recreational operations open to the capacity that they want to within the time frame that they want to. And considering that everybody in the state legislature who voted it said that they were doing this for the patients, not for the tax revenue, they mm -hmm. were doing this for the patients. These exclusion rules mean that the most qualified producers of this medicine for the patients are being barred from entry Absolutely. into this area. And you have to take either illicit growers who were, didn't care what they were spraying on the plants or, or people who were maybe used to growing lettuce uh, and, and putting them in charge. Yeah, this. trying to make the jump. Yes. You know, you mentioned Hawaii. States like Hawaii not only block people convicted of a felony drug offense from applying for a medical marijuana dispensary license, they also apply them from working at a dispensary in any capacity. Um, other states like New Hampshire block anyone with a felony from even serving as a caregiver for patients. So if people have paid for their debt to society, um, they should be able to move on. And if you're really concerned about patients, you should get them the, the most qualified qualified help possible and the most qualified help in this industry are people who uh, were willing to risk their liberty and move forward to help sick people so it's just it, it just blows my mind that, that they're doing this you know there are forgiveness periods in some of these states um, but typically it's 10 years or so but I can tell you that in in eight to ten years from uh, from now uh, the people who were previously convicted will most likely have lost their experience things will have been superseded newer technologies coming yeah. in and all and and they won't be competitive in the in the modern market and they will have missed the boat and by that time it's been 10 years they will have moved on to something else most likely it's just
it, it's just it's a, a crazy situation. It needs to be fixed, uh, and it needs to be fixed across the country. And uh, this yeah, is something yeah. that WeCan is going to be involved yeah, but in. Some of these states also have exclusions for marijuana offenses, also to kind of help. Yes, um, yes. Yeah, some of them uh, exclude marijuana from the felony uh, uh, prohibition uh, on on anyone who'd been uh, convicted of a controlled substance. And uh, in Nevada, certainly in, in the the statute, it says that. Um, uh, an excluded offense does not include something that would have been legal under the current laws. So, so it's possible for people who had state-level uh, felony marijuana arrests. Um, depending on who you were prosecuted by, I believe also there's some strange verbiage in, in there. And depending on who you were distributing to, mm -hmm. you know, if you were just distributing out, uh, you know, to retail dealers, then you you you're not um, covered by this exemption. But if you can prove that you were uh, working with medical patients, you are. And I think it's time for us to take another break, and we will be right back. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. All right. You know, uh, back when I first smoked my first joint in the 70s at, at, a, at a Mardi Gras, um, that was pretty much the only way to do it, you know, a joint or, or, that or a pipe. That was the first way I smoked. Uh, that, that was how it was. And now we have all sorts of different things from, by Philip Smith from Alternet.com. Uh, we've, we've got a story that vape pens and edibles are trendy ways to consume pot, but good old roll-up joints are still number one. And, and they, they talk about the uh, uh, various uh, industry, marijuana industry companies uh, are getting as much data as they possibly can from uh, point-of-sale retailers to, to see where the industry is moving on this. And according to uh, one of these companies, Headset, uh, according to their data, total marijuana sales grew from just under $40 million in April to just over $50 million in May. Tell me, what else on this planet could you get into a business and see 20% growth in a single month. I mean, that's, that's uh, actually, well, 25% growth, uh, right. adding 10 to, to 40. Um, it's just incredible. And so with this money uh, coming into it, there the retailers, the owners are trying to figure out how to maximize of course. their potential. Of course. You know? By product, product category, um, bud sales grew the smallest amount uh, percentage wise. Uh, at about 5%, while the sale of vapes were up, uh, vape pens were up by 30%. Tinctures and creams were up more than 50%, and topicals were up by 70%. And That's interesting. Uh, it is, but understanding, though, that they started from such low points. Right. That it, it's, like, it's like Royal Crown Cola or, or, you know, Mr. Pibb or something like that having a big increase. They're still not going to catch up to Coke and Pepsi right. uh, on that sort of Just stuff. Just because the numbers look good doesn't mean the volume is where is anywhere near equal. You know, but 70% uh, um, uh, topicals, I think that points to a whole new market demographic because um, I've been at various meetings around the valley um, uh, with uh, – some uh, senior groups to try and enlighten them on this. And I'm amazed at how many uh, people who are in their 70s or even their 80s are saying, oh, yes, I'm using medical marijuana now. I, I get an ointment and I rub it on my knee. And these are people <laughs> who've never smoked a joint in their life and, and don't want to start now. But the topicals, which will not get anyone high, uh, still offer the anti-inflammatory and pain relief. Yeah, I... Uh I've I was kind of leery of those. I saw these CBD creams coming out, and I'm like, yeah, you know, do they really work? And uh, my neighbor is like a Vietnam vet, and he's got bad shoulder, bad knee, bad back, bad bad everything. And 
he was telling me, he's like, man, you know, my knees are killing me and this and that. So I gave him some, some CBD uh, cream and I'm just like, give this, give this a shot. You know, so he put it on his knees and he's like, it didn't work. So he put it on his shoulder and he was sitting there uh, watching television and he reached for the remote and he realized that it didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. And he's like, wait a minute. And just kind of gave it one of these and just started going with it and started realizing how he just didn't, it was just subconscious. It's not like a big burning sensation or anything. Mm -hmm. It just works for him. And it's, uh, it's just strange. You know, it, uh, some people don't respond to it, but damn, you know, those people swear by it who, who, yeah. who do. I, I, I mean, they, you know, scouts honor, it works for him. So. I, I've got to say that I was skeptical as well, um, not only of the CBD uh, uh, topicals, but the, the THC-based topicals, and, and saying, oh, it, it just doesn't really sound like it's going to work. But um, as you know, as, as some of our listeners uh, know, um, I had open-heart surgery less than three months ago, and um, boy, that was a surprise. Um, <laughs> but... Anyway, uh, you're not supposed to put anything on the incision till it heals up. Okay, fine. That, that takes a week or so. And after that, though, you've got incredible pain in this, in this chest area where they, where they you know, cut you and cracked you open because it's just skin and the bone. You don't really have muscle there in the, in the middle of your chest. And it hurt like hell. Um, and so I was given some CBD cream to try. And I figured, you know... Boy, this hurts, and, and what's my choice? Popping down more opioids to, to the point where it kills the pain, but it also has all sorts of unwanted side effects. Mm -hmm. uh, let me try a little of this. And I put this CBD cream on, and I gotta say, within 10 to 15 minutes, that pain was gone. I was, I was astounded, and I, obviously, I've been a long time proponent of the use of medical cannabis. I was absolutely astounded by the level of pain relief that uh, that I got from that and just as a, a without intoxication none whatsoever uh, you know I if, I, I, I could have pissed in a cup and, and done a UA and and it would not have shown anything because it does not uh, enter the bloodstream uh, this it's, way. it's like you said you've been telling me for a long time if cannabis was discovered a few years ago it would be this magic plant if, if everyone... cannabis did not have a euphoric effect if it didn't get people high yeah it would be it would be Oh, a miracle, a miracle plant. drug, yeah. And you know, for for some of the people so that I dealt with who have terminal cancer or or other very advanced diseases, and at the end of their life, what's wrong with a little euphoria? What what's wrong with letting them feel uh, okay? And and you know, as as uh, when, when I had this heart surgery, uh, and and I came out of it, I'm in the hospital. I have an on-demand morphine drip you know pump that thing you know you can't pump it more than once every eight minutes but you know you can keep going you every can, eight minutes yeah 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 you, and, and you can you can get your dose within two or two or three clicks and, and that's fine and I, I would be there and my wife would come to visit and she'd say you know you just doze off and and that's the thing people who have these terminal diseases cancers which are horribly painful uh they're they're clicking that pen as quick as they can and they're getting these doses and and they're they're either falling asleep because of it or, or they're just out of it whereas with cannabis yeah you might be a little high yeah you you might get a little off track but you're able to interact with your family and you know <laughs> if there's a fire in the building you're gonna make it out if you're on morphine i don't I don't know what your chances are depending on the dosage for sure. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the fact that marijuana industry in general is now operating in an increasingly legal environment means that entrepreneurs are more willing to experiment with innovative prof products and have channels to bring them to market. Oh, well, that's you know, the champ show all day yeah, long. Yeah, really. And even even 10 years ago, um, walking into dispensaries in, in California, you didn't see all these topicals. You didn't see all these oils. No, things were basic back in the day. You had flowers, your pre-roll joints, your basic brick hash, your keef, and things like that, and your homemade edibles, basically. And now, I mean, hell, even when I was, even in 2010, there was a lot of homemade stuff going around. And now... The packaging is very professional. Mm -hmm. It's very well put together. The brand names are really strong now. Um, the reputations across state lines for some of and these brand names tested. are really strong. Oh yeah, the laboratory testing is real good. And uh, 
the legitimacy of the industry just through the packaging and the retail side of it has grown leaps and bounds, not to mention mm -hmm. the vast number of products, you know, refrigerators, and full of products. Ancillary business that, that we're talking about, I mean, I making could, the blister packs, oh, yeah, I couldn't, doing the printing. I, I can't think of all of the products that I've seen that have been pushed to these dispensaries in the past few months. Gums and trochies and and just gummies and like anything you can think of that they can try to put cannabis in that they think will appeal to a market they'll do it mm -hmm. they have vegan coconut thc capsules for vegans who don't want to have uh animal-based products and they have you know dark you know dark chocolate cbd infused like everything you can think of man it's there powder for putting in your for your hot drinks it that has thc in it me because mankind has been using cannabis in some form or another since mankind evolved into mankind you know since prehistory since prehistory and uh, with that little enlightenment we're going to take another break and we'll be right back hi i'm armin yemenijan ceo of essence dispensaries and i'd like to let you know a little bit about our company as a completely complimentary service our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices we have three convenient locations we have one location on tropicana between decatur and jones which is our west side location our henderson location is on the corner of sunset and green valley parkway and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the las vegas strip on the corner of las vegas boulevard and sahara our prices are the lowest Lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. All right, we're back again with the Nevada Cannabis News Hour, and uh, coming into our next segment, we want to talk about um, uh, an article from the Huffington Post uh, that said war on weeds end in sight and uh, it's it says that the the end of the federal government's war on weed is approaching fast yay yeah, that titled 1969 right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. no no that, that would have been 1976 just oh, before okay. Hamilton Carter went to Hamilton Jordan went to a uh, the normal Christmas party and that's a whole nother story mm -hmm. but no matter how the details work out it seems pretty much clear at this point that the federal government is going to end this war on cannabis and it, it's about time you know and we can look at various ways that that's going to happen first off is that the DEA is about to report uh, what they're going to do they've been talking about rescheduling uh, cannabis and uh, they they said they were going to have it done by the end of June and of course they're delaying because their budget so much of their budget is about pot and and so uh, any day now though we should be hearing what their decision is uh, their the completion of their review on the status of cannabis uh, regarding federal law and um, you know I understand they're dragging their feet but we'll see what happens you know if they when they do so uh, they will likely recommend a downgrade from schedule one to at least schedule two now schedule two is where cocaine is and where Vicodin is and you know they have perka Stands, the, a lot the, the of really heavy, heavy stuff. Yeah. Really heavy stuff. You know, um, and 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 Schedule Two will not uh, allow for that much more research than is being done now, which is almost none. Um, although a strong cases could be made to regulate it down to Schedule Three to, or to Schedule Five, and and so uh, that would be much less restrictive. And you know, Schedule Fives might be things like sleeping aids or, or you know, higher dose uh, anti you know allergy medications or that sort of stuff <laughs> that, that that wouldn't be too I bad I didn't realize those things were scheduled uh, well in That's high, interesting okay, okay you can, it's like it's an over-the-counter medicine so aspirin is also scheduled somewhere within the drug you, you, can, you can go to the any store and you can buy 200 milligram tablets of acetaminophen or ibuprofen uh, Tylenol or Advil right. trade names and you can buy that retail however if you go to the doctor uh, and you get a prescription for 800 milligram pills um, it's the same medication you're just taking four times as much and sometimes you're in need of that um, but the idea that you can buy the stuff in the store and yet to get a higher dose rather than having to just take a couple of extra pills you have to go to the doctor and get a prescription right. get a prescription filled I have always wondered about that why do I have to go to the doctor to get ibuprofen 800s but it's just is what it is I suppose uh, 
because you because of scheduling. Too stoned to count to four. I don't. I don't. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, to totally unregulated, right? Hmm. So we're we're gonna see what happens. But even even if they dig their heels in, they refuse to recommend any changes. They might spark a backlash from other parts of the government because. Uh, I think that even though politicians are uh, not leading on this issue and they're far behind the people, uh, they, they realize that there are enough of us out there with torches and pitchforks that they've <laughs> got to do something. Uh, you know, so how could this happen? Well, the President Obama could act on his own and through an executive order by a stroke of his pen or really in this case it's, it's uh, the Attorney General uh, who, who's Loretta Lynch. Um, could uh, reschedule it because the DEA is under the auspices of the Department of Justice which is run uh, headed up by the Attorney General and so the Attorney General could uh, could decide to to move forward on this now we know that the president has had a very mixed record on this issue um, you know he, he little that he's made fun of it I was gonna say I wouldn't I wouldn't count on it like that's a nice pipe dream like oh you know he could use his executive authority to kind of help us out here. Will well, he? You know, yeah. what about his friends, the, the the Chum gang that he was a member of when he was in high school, right? How how come it's okay for Bill Clinton and George W. Bush and Barack Obama to have all smoked pot in their youth and 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 um, uh, credible reports, or or that Laura Bush was a was a dime bag dealer in college? How come these people get away with this stuff, and yet somehow? the rest of us can't be trusted to have that kind of responsible use and and what they had was responsible use because mm -hmm. obviously they moved forward on on to very successful careers in their lives no so doubt. you know are, are they somehow uh, smarter or better or more responsible <laughs> than the rest of us no i i don't buy into that elitist view so he could act on this you know and you know, but because it is the DEA's decision here, uh, it really falls under the Attorney General, and so uh, they could do that. Um, Congress also doesn't even need to to be involved in this policy um, in order to do this, but they could they could schedule it. And there is recent movement uh, on on the medical side from not only uh, ardent supporters of the end of prohibition like Earl Blumenauer but mm -hmm. from some of the the most stringent opponents and pro prohibitionists uh, to at least allow medical research to move forward on this and so um, you know it's uh, it, it's going to happen. It's going to happen soon. The Democratic Party, as I reported last week, has put a, a plank in their new platform uh, of this year to uh, to get a, a a path towards legalization and to, to do more study. Uh, you know, and and this really this was a result of, of Bernie Sanders saying, "Hey, it's got to be descheduled. We've got to treat it like alcohol and and tobacco." And uh, that approach has worked in a number of states, like Colorado, Washington, mm -hmm. uh, Oregon, obviously. Uh, Canada, uh, um, Alaska had uh, decriminalized uh, back in the in the 70s. Yeah. You know, so so it's going to happen, and it's going to happen soon. Oh. So meanwhile, on the Republican meanwhile, side, meanwhile, yeah, there's one not only point a, that I not only up. did uh, not only did they strike the medical marijuana portion of their platform out of their I, I don't even want to get into that out, of the, out, of, out of the party platform. Yeah, but uh, Trump picked Mike Pence from Indiana as his vice president surprisingly I didn't as a cannabis enthusiast consumer uh, patient advocate I don't really like that pick any more than I do Christie uh, he hasn't been as publicly vocal about how he hates us but he hasn't been our when friend he was in either. Congress he was yeah well now that he's been the governor he's tr done his best to suppress the Indiana uh, voter a initiatives and things like that. Absolutely, like, uh, you know, he, possession of over ago, he successfully, thirty grams yeah. is is still punishable by up to Felony. two and a half years in prison. Mike Pence is fine with that. In fact, three years ago, he successfully blocked a move in the legislature to reduce some of those penalties, saying that while he wanted to cut prison populations, he didn't want to cut penalties to achieve that end. I think we need to focus on reducing crime, not reducing penalties, he said. I think this legislation, as it moves forward, should seek to continue to send a strong message to the people of Indiana, in particular to those who would come into our state to deal drugs. We are going to be tough and stay tough on narcotics in this state, a.k.a. I hate the dope. 
I yeah. hate the dopers. Let's build more prisons. Let's not build schools. Yeah, let's, let's build it, it, the prisons. It's just one of those. It's so. just, you know, Pence has been handsomely compensated by tobacco companies for his advocacy against anti smoking pub, public health campaigns, even though they have no, pr uh, <laughs> even though they have proven wildly successful in driving down smoking rates. Mike Pence is a man who rejects proven public health interventions for one dangerous substance while insisting on failed punitive prohibitionist policies for another less dangerous substance. Yeah, Mike Pence has said in 2000 that, um, that, Smoking cigarettes does not cause lung cancer. Like, the I, Surgeon I, 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 General of the United States in 1964 determined that it did. Uh, crazy. I, last thought I, on that? Last thought on that is I just uh, hope if they do make it to the White House that uh, I, 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 it's starting to look worse and worse. If Christie becomes the Attorney General and Pence is the VP, it's going to be a tough. It's going to be a tough sell, especially with the Republican Congress if they get in to get anything done on a federal level for a long time. Oh boy! So I'm really keeping my fingers crossed that someone comes to see the light. On well, this in the not too like like, future. like Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg said a couple of weeks ago, uh, if Trump gets elected president, it may be time to move to New Zealand. So. <laughs> Without, without trying to be too political on that point, um, I want to thank you for um, uh, listening to another session of the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. We will be back next week. There, there is no slow time right now uh, in cannabis news. We always have more than we can cover uh, because it's really it's happening, and, and I hope you feel the change and, and be involved in the change. It's really important. Thanks so much for listening. Register vote.